Today, the book of Revelation, next week conclusion for the, all of the class, and then a final exam. Um, and I appreciate your all's patience and your dedication for continuing to show up when we've had two different breaks in this, in this course. The book of Revelation, um, we're talking about, we believe that it was written by John, the apostle and evangelist. John the Apostle, because he was one of the original 12, I mean, there was more than 12 apostles, but he was one of the original 12, the youngest of the 12. He was the beloved disciple, um, the one who, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, um, son, behold your mother, and mother, behold your son, meaning he gave his mother Mary to John for the two of them to care for each other, both because John at that point was very young, he was probably somewhere around 16, and uh, Mary, of course, would have been a single woman at that point, no. And so the tradition is that John, when he went to Ephesus, which has to do with where he did his writing, we believe that he wrote this book on Patmos, but Patmos was simply an imprisonment during his time of living in Ephesus, and that they lived together. And there is still a traditional house of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Ephesus, actually in, uh, not in Ephesus proper, but in another part of Seljuk, which is the, the the uh, name of the town now. And um, this, so this is an icon of John. This is an, an icon as well, where John is hearing a vision and is writing the, um, the Revelation, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was written on the island of Patmos. And we know that because he starts right out saying, I, John, was on the island of Patmos. And he has a vision in which he writes this down. By the way, I considered today, and I didn't do it because nobody wants to be subjected to somebody else's slideshow, I have photographs from six of the seven locations of the churches of, uh, well, what's left of, the locations of six of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Um, I've had a lot of photographs from Patmos and that sort of thing. I didn't bring them because, again, I don't know if you all are interested in that or want to go to somebody else's slides. Um, would you care to see any of that stuff? I mean, I'm not talking about an hour's worth, but... Mm -hmm. 10 or 15 minutes worth, because I could bring slides next week and show you some of the background from this stuff. Um, two years ago, Carolyn and I, in, if you know, Linda Dean Hansen from our church, uh, we went on a trip with First Century Cruises, it's called. They specialize in going to biblical sites. We were on a sailing ship, a real live sailing ship, where the people, you know, the guys had to climb up the mast to uh, run out the sails and all that. It wasn't a computerized thing uh, called the Sea Cloud 2. Um, and we visited six of the seven churches mentioned in the chapters two and three of Revelation, or at least the sites, there are no churches there anymore. Um, this is in modern day Turkey, and it's 98, 90, depending on who you ask, 98 or 99% Islamic. Um, and so we didn't go to Thyatira because apparently there's nothing there to see. But the others, there are still ruins, and then you know you get some sense of it. So anyway, if you're interested next week, perhaps I'll bring some photos and you know, let you see some, some of them, including some pictures of the Isle of Patmos. Um, where this book was written. Now, <clears throat> did you say I, you went to Patmos? Yes, yeah, I've been there twice actually. Um, we did that on the Footsteps of Faith trip as well. And um, during John's time, it was a sort of prison island. The prisoners of Rome were sent there in exile. <clears throat> and I'll get into that in a few minutes, but um, it's there's now some very pretty little towns there. In fact, um, Condé Nast, one of the big travel magazines, said that, that the ideal place in the world now, if you want to get back to a simple lifestyle, is Patmos. Uh, there are several very pretty little villages there. Right on the water, there are several different harbors. Uh, and then the, the monastery of St. John, which was built much later, of course, is right at the peak of the tallest hill on, uh, on Patmos. So I'll bring you some pictures. Is but, there trees? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, it's not. It's it's a decent sized island. I mean, it's only I think it's only like 12 miles long, but you know there are roads on it. So um, now we believe. I say we because I'm giving you a conservative interpretation. It's the traditional interpretation, and uh, and the one that more people are even going back to now is that the Revelation, the Book of Revelation, was written by John, who is the apostle, meaning one of the twelve, and the evangelist, meaning. He wrote the Gospel of John. The evangelists are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the people who wrote the four Gospels. So we believe that John, the youngest of the disciples, or apostles, wrote the Gospel of John, the three letters of John, which we've looked at already, and the book of Revelation. There are some, in order to get published, 
who have proposed that that the John who wrote the, the book of Revelation was not the same John, that in fact he, and they called him John of Patmos, or John the Elder, the, the uh, John the Presbyterian, meaning John the Elder. Um, the, some people think that 1st, 2nd, 3rd John were written by John the Elder. So they come up with three or even four different Johns that they assign the, the writings of John. The traditional view, the one that is attested to by all of the early church fathers, is that all of those books were written by John the Apostle and Evangelist, and that's what I believe and maintain. Yes? It's all great to me, but it seems like Revelation to me is so much different than the Gospel of John and the three letters of John. It's a different genre, and we're going to talk about that. Actually, the book of Revelation reflects three different genres. It actually, um, there are some aspects of it, the language that seem that there may have been an editor, and as we said before, as, you know, we, there are inspired editors. We don't have a problem with that. But it's actually true that if you study the content, there's a lot of similarities between the Gospel of John and um, the, the Book of Revelation. For instance, only in those books is Jesus referred to as the Word of God. There is a, this Christology, in other words, the, the doctrine of Jesus that comes out between the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation are very similar. Jesus is not mentioned by name very many times in the book of Revelation, but he is referred to often. And so there are particular kind of word usages like, uh, like uh, the Word of God for Jesus and other kinds of constructions that when you dig into it are very similar between uh, Revelation and John. And again, I believe um, pretty much all conservative scholars, and more and more all the time, people are saying that the similarities between like the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, in language and symbolism and word usage, that kind of thing, are there's much more similar about them than there is different about them. Now you're right, the Book of Revelation is not like anything else, at least in the New Testament. There are little fragments of uh, apocalyptic writing elsewhere. In 1 Thessalonians, uh, in some of the Gospels, when Jesus says, um, when Ananias thy priest asked him, Are you the Son of God? He says, um, It is as you say, or I am, and you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds in power. That's an apolo uh, a, 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 uh, apocalyptic statement you know, about in times coming. I'll get into that. But the main thing that we believe is that it's not a different John, but rather that it is John the Apostle and Evangelist. Okay? Um, let's look at some of the details about the book. Again, we believe it was written by John the Apostle. Actually, John identifies himself as John four times in this book. Three times in the first chapter, verses 1, 4, and 9. And then in chapter 22, verse 8, he identifies himself as being John. Um, again, we believe that he was exiled on Patmos. There are two time periods where it might have happened. One, some people believe he was exiled during the end of the Neronian uh, persecution which was mostly in Rome, but as I say, if the emperor was persecuting people in Rome, it undoubtedly must have spread out some. Um, that would have made it in the 60s, at the same, the same time that uh, Paul was killed. But I believe, and there are more people who believe, that John was exiled to the island of Patmos during the reign of the emperor Domitian. Domitian, uh, that's D-O-M-I-T-I-A-N, Emperor Domitian, who uh, reigned toward the end of the first century. He was especially adamant uh, for emperor worship. In fact, he insisted people refer to him when they spoke to him as my Lord and my God. That's, that's how he demanded that you talk to him. And so he was really clamping down, insisting that everyone in the Roman Empire practice emperor worship. And there are temples to emperor worship throughout the, you know, the, there are ruins throughout the, the whole of the Roman world. You go to Ephesus and there's a temple to Hadrian, there's a temple to various uh, to emperors. So Domitian was especially hot on this. He started persecuting people to force them to worship the emperor. And of course the two groups that would not worship the emperor were the Jews and the Christians. As long as the Christians were, had been seen as a part of Judaism, they were left alone because the Jews had a long-standing pass from the Roman emperors to, to not force them to worship other gods or to worship the emperor. The simple reason being that the Jews proved to be too valuable. They were great bankers, they were well educated, 
um, they proved to be very useful. And at a certain point in history, the Romans, when they started taking over areas where Jews were, they had to make the decision, either we're going to have to kill all these people, or we're going to have to not try to force them to worship anything other than their single, you know, their, their singular God, uh, Yahweh. And so they gave them a pass because they thought the Jews were too valuable. Well, Christians were not so much valuable. And so once they started being seen as separate from Judaism, they were not given that same pass. And when they did not agree to worship the emperor, then they came under persecution. So we believe, I believe, most people believe, that this book was written during the Domitian persecution in the late 90s. So we believe it was written 95-96, toward the very end of, Paul, of uh, John's life. He lived to be almost 100, apparently. He was very young, again, during the time with Jesus. Uh, with Jesus. And Jesus' uh, crucifixion, he was probably 16 or 17, maybe. And so um, we get to this point, and he would have been into his 80s. We believe that he probably lived until right around the end of the century. So um, much longer than anyone else. The, both the authorship by John and the dating is attested to by more sources than any other New Testament book. So there's no question about that. The theme of this book is to encourage prophecy, uh, an encouraging prophecy of the final days and God's ultimate triumph. And really it's to assure the recipients, many of whom were suffering persecution, and again, that's part of it, is trying to figure out which persecution was this. Um, we believe it likely was Domitian's persecution the ultimate triumph of Christ against all of those who oppose him and his saints. And the special concern was that because the Roman emperors were increasing persecution to force emperor worship, okay? So that's the general facts about it. Um, in a little, a little, so it's been said that the book of Revelation almost has to be felt as much as it's read. You know, there's so much visceral kind of stuff, so much symbolism, so much, uh, that, those sorts of things going on, but you could say that this really is a book about power. It's a book about the power that's being wielded by secular authorities and the fact that God's power trumps that. And all that will happen to eventually demonstrate that God's power is superior. It's a book about battle, you know, there's wars going on in this, about freedom, about faith, about evil, about hope. Ultimately, it is about the salvation and eventual complete redemption that will come in the Son of God, who is the Word of God, Jesus. Um, this book, as I'm sure you realize, has a central place, perhaps more than any other book, in Christian eschatology. Eschatology, those of you who have taken uh, the, some of the systematic classes, eschatology means the, the doctrines of the end times. It's not really end times because it's not going to end, but of the last days. Um, eschaton, Greek, means the final things or the end things. So Christian eschatology is basically the idea of what's going to happen at the end. How's this all going to wrap up? You know, what's the final chapter say? And Revelation, more than any other single book, is part of that understanding of the, the end times, or the, the last days, if you will. Like I say, end times is a misnomer because it doesn't really end. Um, Revelation is complex in a lot of ways. One of the first ways, and this, this addresses something that your question, Bob, it reflects at least three completely different genres in one book. Now, there are different literary genres reflected. Clearly, this class is on the epistles. Well, epistles is a genre. Basically, it's letters, you know, letter writing. It's, so, um, epistolary is the adjective that we use for that. This is, uh, the book of Revelation is uh, an epistolary work because it involves letters, a letter being written out. It's written to the whole church, but in specifics, in the second and third chapter, he is writing notes embedded in the letter to seven different churches. And so it's both epistolary in terms of its overall purpose of being distributed to the churches, but also in terms of the specific messages to certain churches. So... The genres, first epistolary. Second, it is apocalyptic. The actual title of this book is sometimes listed as the Apocalypse or the Apocalypse of St. John because the first word in this book, in fact, I'll go to this, the first word in this book in Greek is apocalypsis. The, book, uh, the word apocalypsis is where we get our, our word apocalypse. Apocalypse does not mean the end of all things, everything blows up, everybody dies. That's not what it means. You know, that's the meaning we have tended to give it. 
Apocalypse instead means a revelation. You see where we get, you know, our, our word revelation, because apocalypsis, which gets translated to apocalypse, is the first word in this book. Often in the Bible, the first word gets turned into the title. The book of Genesis, which is the book of creation or beginnings, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The first word in Hebrew is creation or beginning. Um, and so that's why it's called Genesis. In this case, the book of Revelation or the book of the Apocalypse, the first word is Apocalypsis. And so that became the title. Apocalypse means a revelation, a disclosure of knowledge, a, the lifting of a veil, the um, uncovering of something that has been hidden. It does not mean everybody blows up. It does not mean the end of the world. It's just come to suggest that because of this book and other things that are apocalyptic writing. So this book is epistolary, is one genre it reflects. Uh, uh, an apocalyptic work is the second. And the third is it is a prophetic book. It speaks the word of God very plainly, sort of thus saith the word, but it also does so in terms of telling what's going to happen. It is, it is a futuristic, it's a, a future telling prophecy. So those three, epistolary, apocalyptic, and prophetic, it's all of those. And in being all of those, it is highly symbolic. Um, it's, I, I should say, too, it's the only book in the New Testament which is entirely considered a work of uh, an apocalyptic work as a genre. It has the other things in it, too, but it's primarily seen as an apocalyptic work. There are pieces of ap ap apocalyptic writing, as I said earlier, in various places in the New Testament, but only short passages. Pretty much this entire book can be interpreted as apocalyptic with aspects of being an epistle and of being prophetic for the things that are come. Um, now, let's face it, the book of Revelation can seem kind of weird. And for that reason, with all of the symbolism, it is so symbolic, it was the last book to be accepted as canon in the New Testament, to be accepted as God's word to us. For the New Testament. It was not approved finally as canon. In fact, some scholars think it was even later. Uh, the Council of Carthage in North Africa in AD 397. So this is, you know, 360 years plus after the time of Jesus. That means that it would not have been approved for as canon until 300 years after it was written. 397. Now there's several reasons for that. One is the difficulty in interpretation. Because the sim there's so much symbolism. It is hard to figure out what it means sometimes, and people have really differed in interpreting. Uh, but the biggest, the biggest reason probably it had difficulty in being accepted as canon is because almost from the first time it became known, various heresies, like the Montanists, for instance, took this book and claimed it as their own and said it reflected their particular doctrine. So the Orthodox Church, I don't mean Eastern Orthodox, at that point, there was no Eastern Orthodox. At this point, we're just talking about the right belief Orthodox. The church looked at this and said, if all of these cults are using it to try to prove their point, then do we think it's true or not? And it took them a long time to finally realize, yes, this is God's word, whether somebody else is using it falsely or not. I mean, the Montanists, one of the, one of the uh, heretical sects, they started using it um, as, as early as early to mid second century. So it had, it had been around less than 50 years before it already was being used for something that was not considered Orthodox Christianity. And so that created a problem. But as I said, the book of Revelation is attested to as being uh, available by John quite early by more sources than any other ancient, uh, than any other New Testament book. That is ancient church sources. More of them say that this was written by John and is for our edification than anything, even though the church took a long time to officially accept it as canon. And the, the early church fathers were all, the earliest church fathers, the, the apostolic age and the patristic age, were all over before the official canon got declared. And so even though those earlier leaders in the church were saying that this is God's word, it took a while later when they're actually trying to decide what fits in the canon for them to agree this was so. Okay? Now, there are more allusions to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation than any other New Testament book by a considerable distance. It quotes a lot of the prophetic books especially, and uh, many references to Isaiah, to Daniel, to Ezekiel, to Psalms, and even to Joel. Um, the, especially 
there are big sections of Daniel. Daniel's considered predominantly an apocalyptic book, even though there's history in it, um, because of the visions that Daniel had. In fact, some of the visions that occur in Revelation are directly taken from Daniel, from Ezekiel, from uh, sections of Psalms. Um, we get the, the multiple beasts that represent the forces of evil, including the many horned beasts, the beast from the sea, the beast from the land, various angels, the four horsemen, the representation of lampstands, and by the way, lampstands always represent churches. The, represent, the use of stars as symbols, stars always represent angels, just so you know. The four living beings, the fact that a scroll was to be eaten and have a sweet flavor, which comes from Ezekiel and is also in, in Revelation. The marks on the forehead, the, eye, the, the image of locusts, which look like horses but have teeth like lions, that's taken from the book of Joel. So there is a lot of this apocalyptic imagery that comes from elsewhere. And people would say, well, somebody sit down and just cut and paste here? Well, uh, we are told this was a vision given to John and that he wrote it down as the vision came to him on Patmos. The symbolism that was, that was given uh, by inspiration to Daniel and Ezekiel, there's no reason to believe that that imagery is not also exactly the same imagery that was given by in a vision to John when he was on Patmos. I don't think we should have a problem with that. Um, but the fact is that all of this imagery, some of which is very obscure and uh, difficult to interpret, has led to a lot of different interpretations. Often, this book more than any other has been misused, I believe, of any other New Testament book. Sects, cults, people with just bad theology will take a, a verse or a section out of, out of Revelation and use it to support their own ideas, their own doctrine, their own beliefs. Um, Revelation apparently was a favorite book of David Koresh, the guy who you know, was responsible for the, the uh, Waco, I was trying to remember the name, you know, the Waco uh, uh, the problem. So, yeah, anytime, anytime there's been a desire to go heavy prophecy, you know, apocalyptic, into the world kind of stuff, they immediately go to Revelation. Um, and they, it gets very selectively quoted. And I think that you have to be prepared to, to deal with this whole book if you're going to deal with it. You don't take one, one image of a bowl and plague or one image of a, of a trumpet or of a, you know, or any of that and expect that you're going to develop a theology around it. And yet people do that too often. Mostly those people who have their own thing going and are not really seeking to know the truth of the Lord. Um, despite the fact that it has a lot of imagery in it that's difficult for us, um, despite the fact that it's really frightening to a lot of people, you know, people get scared off from this because they don't understand it. This book is very important. There is a, there's a reason why this book appears at the end of our Bible. It is the ideal in not only the New Testament, but to all of Scripture, because it does tell us how is all this going to finish. And it ends with the, the establishment of the reign of God, the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit over all of creation for all time. This is the way it needs to end. And so it's the perfect finish. And it ends, too, with come quickly, Lord. Maranatha. Um, so, the, as an apocalyptic writing and prophetic writing, the word prophecy... Prophecy, prophesy, prophesying, you know, prophetic is used over 20 times in this book. So clearly it has a strong prophetic kind of meaning as well. Now, I want to give you, and, and this is going to seem like um, a little technical to you all, but, but stay, stick with me here. Because Revelation is complicated and has a lot of symbolism, people have always asked the question, well, uh, what, what are they talking about? There are four major views for how to interpret Revelation with regard to what it's talking about in history. And I'm going to give you those four right now. The first one is the historicist view, it's called. This, the historicist view says that when you look at the book of Revelation, it's dealing with the whole broad view of history. That the book of Revelation isn't dealing with a certain period of time, as some people think, and I'll, we'll talk about that in the others, but rather it's looking at the whole scope of history, but that it is historical. Okay? That's the first view, historicist. It is talking about real history, 
but all of history, not a limited period of time. The second view is called the preterist. And if you know anything about language, if you guys study the preterist tense, preterist means past tense. Okay? So the preterist view is that the Revelation, the book of Revelation refers to events that have already happened in the past, especially in the apostolic area, uh, era, rather, but then perhaps all the way up through the end of the Roman Empire. So they take the symbolism and they assign it to various events that happen from the death of Jesus up until the end of the Roman Empire in the 400s or so. And they believe that the book is about that time period. The third view is the futurist view. The futurist view believes that everything we read in Revelation has yet to occur, that all of it is still in the future. So Revelation describes future events. That's the futurist idea. And finally, there the, there's the idealist, or some people call it the symbolic perspective, which says that Revelation doesn't refer to actual people or actual events. And this is something people do. They say, oh, well, the reference right here of the Whore of Babylon, that is the Pope, or whatever. You know, or maybe it was, you know, Pope Leo IV, or, you know, that they, they're very specific about it. They take all of these images and try to assign, or events, and try to assign them to historical um, events or people. Well, the idealist or symbolic view says, no, don't do that. That this is not intended to link up on a one-to-one -one relationship with actual events and people in history, but rather it is an allegory, meaning a story that, while it's not factual in a, in a historical sense, it does represent truths. So it's an allegory of the spiritual path and ongoing struggle between good and evil that will ultimately end with God controlling everything. Okay? Those are the four views. Historicist, preterist, futurist, and idealist or symbolic. The two names for that. Um, it'd be very difficult for us to, you know, to talk too much specifically about that. I, would, I, I tend toward a futurist view, but with qualifications. I believe that the cautions that are written to the twelve church or the, the the seven churches of Revelation are just that. They're cautions of those churches. There are things for us uh, that we should learn from that as well. But um, most of what's ha being talked about, I believe, is yet to come. Now, you don't have to agree with that. It doesn't matter, because none of us know. Someday we're going to find out. And that'll be fun. <laughs> I have a long list. Um, but you get the idea. Now, chapters 2 and 3 in this book are written with messages to specific churches that existed in uh, Asia, or Asia, Asia was a province within Asia Minor, Asia, Mi Asia Minor being all of what we know as currently uh, the nation of Turkey. This, all of this was Asia Minor. This particular section of it was known, as you see there, as Asia. But Asia Minor included Cappadocia and Galatia and Mycia and uh, Lycia and a lot of other places. Now, the seven churches, which it's kind of hard to see on this map, but if you start here, this is Ephesus, right on the coast. There is a circle here, roughly speaking, the churches were 50 to 75 miles apart. They were all churches that were part of the area that John, the apostle, was, seen, was sort of the elder over. They all had their own pastors. For instance, in Ephesus, Timothy, of first and second Timothy, Timothy became the pastor of the church in Ephesus and may have become a local bishop. But even, all the pastors, all the bishops from this region all look to John as being the senior elder, the one who had known Jesus, who had written so much about the life of Jesus and, and etc. And so he was the elder. Now some people talk about John the elder as though it were a different person. No. I believe, we believe John the Elder was the same person as John of Patmos, who was John the Apostle. Okay? Now, the churches, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do that. The churches, starting with Ephesus there, hard to see, sorry, and then Smyrna, up here to Pergamum, a little further, Thyatira, Sardis, um, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and then back to Ephesus. Okay? There's a circle there. There are, in all of those places except Thyatira, there are still ruins of the churches that exist there. And in some places, like Philadelphia, it apparently was a very large church because the, the pillars, that, they're not pillars, they're, they're brick sort of pediments that would have supported arches are huge. I mean, they're, wider, they're as white as this room. 
Um, so it was a huge church at one point. Um, in Ephesus, the church of St. John, in the Basilica actually of St. John, is a huge church. I actually showed you a picture of that last week, I think, when we talked about 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, a picture of the ruins. Uh, it was an enormous church. So some of these were very large churches, but those seven were seen as the leading churches in this whole region of Western, um, of, of Western Turkey, or Western Asia Minor, the region called Asia. It's very confusing. Asia was inside Asia Minor. You'd think Asia Minor was smaller, right? It's like mother of saltpeter, because it's made from saltpeter. You'd think it'd be the other way around. Okay, anyway, <laughs> all right. Um, and so, John is writing warnings of various kinds. Some of them are spiritual warnings about get your act together. Some of them have to do with warnings about future persecution. Some of them have positive things to say to the churches. Um, Smyrna and Philadelphia, for example, are warned about coming persecutions. Now, um, some, one of the things you need to understand, which is mentioned in here, in the second chapter, um, it, there's a reference to, um, don't be the, like the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were a sect that believed in compromising the, the particulars of the faith in order to get along with the local governments, in order to get along with the Roman government, more specifically. And the Nicolaitans had gone so far in terms of compromising that they even left the door open to pagan worship, that it's okay to worship the emperor and still be a Christian. And so a lot of what... Uh, what John is doing here is he is closing the door on some of those kinds of heretical teachings and some of the things that were going wrong in these churches, all right? Um, before I get into the outline, we're going to look at, at the, the, a short version of the statements for those seven churches. Seven is very important here. Seven is, is considered a holy number, and so the, there are 52 different uses of the number seven the book of Revelation. It's another part of the symbolism. Um, the book has an introduction, very brief introduction, just three verses, and then seven sections, each of which has seven visions. And then there's a conclusion, a very short conclusion. So seven sections, each with seven visions, um, and those visions are of seven churches, which is the first two chapters, Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven visions, seven bowls, each of which represent the pouring out of a plague, seven words about the fall of Babylon, and seven final visions. Okay, so seven sevens. There actually is, um, there, there's some, a lot of other numbers in here, for instance. They talk about Israel, that Israel will be saved. 144,000 of the, the people of Israel will be saved. Some people, again, picking and choosing without really being thoughtful about it, have said that, well, that means literally 144,000 Jews and no more will be saved. 144,000, which is 12 times 12. 12 was a very important number to the Jewish people. Um, 12 was the number of the children of Abraham. 12 was the number of the tribes of Israel, etc., etc. It was used a lot. So 144,000 is 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And it's supposed to mean a lot. When they use a number like that, like they would say 70 times 7, they didn't literally mean, you know, 1,440 or whatever, you know, 1,400, whatever that works out to. They meant a lot. So when it says 144,000, that is a symbol that means a lot of people. Okay, not literally that number. So, I mentioned to you some of the other symbols, stars or angels, lamps, hands, or churches. It's believed that Babylon, which is referred to in here, the whore of Babylon, is probably referring to Rome. Because where was the trouble coming from for these, these early Christians? Who was persecuting them because they were refusing to worship the emperor? It was Rome. And so Rome gets labeled as Babylon, which is a symbol for all that was evil. Okay? Now, why, did, why was Babylon the symbol for all that was evil? What happened to the Jewish people in 586? The temple and the city of Jerusalem were destroyed by the Babylonians and they were taken off into exile into Babylon. So Babylon became symbolic to the Jews. And remember, early on here, all, all of the early Christians, probably not by this date, but early on all of the first Christians were Jewish. And so a lot of the symbolism that the Jews had carried over. And, and the meaning was understood. And that's why Babylon is a symbol for the center of evil. 
that destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem, and now is seeking to destroy the faith of Jesus Christ through the persecution, right? Okay. Any questions about any of that so far? Yes. Well, it's, it's kind of on that. John was over, you know, the bishop of these churches, or the elder of these churches. So it would seem likely that it was after Paul. Yes. Paul would have died uh, 30 years before that. I see. Um, Paul, uh, he came to Ephesus fairly early, I mean like 50s, and was responsible for the church, if not planting, there may have been some people who came before, he doesn't actually say he started the church like he does in some places. But if the church existed there, it was Paul that encouraged it. Paul, Paul spent more time in Ephesus than anywhere else. He spent uh, almost three years there. He was almost, he was a year and a half or so in Corinth. But, um, and so Paul was responsible for really growing the church. But Paul died in the 60s. And so between the 60s and the mid-late 90s, which is what we're talking about here, that was a period of time in which the church really grew in Western, you know, Paul was... Some of the places that Paul went to, you know, like uh, Galatia, these are the churches of Galatia. Derby, Iconium, Lystra, uh, Perga, that's where Paul planted the early churches. And then later on missionary journeys, he crossed over and he spent time here in Ephesus, um, as well as over here in Corinth. And, you know, this is Greece, what we know as Greece today. Well, it was part of this known as Greece then, too, but it, had, it was broken up in the Roman provinces. Um, this little dot right there, that's the island of Patmos, and the dot's bigger than the island on this map, so it gives you an idea, it's not a very big place. But that's where they would send exiles. So, um, I can tell you all sorts of other stories, but I won't do that right now. <laughs> uh, it's a fascinating place. If you, if you ever can, um, visiting Patmos, visiting Ephesus, Ephesus is, is if not the, certainly one of the most important archaeological sites in the world, they estimate that they've uncovered less than 10% of Ephesus. And it's still one of the largest largest archaeological sites you'll ever walk through. Okay. Um, very significant. Um, so, visit Ephesus. And most of these places have towns, modern towns, next door. Uh, in a few cases, like the Smyrna, uh, the town north of Ephesus, uh, he, here, is another coastal city. Today it's the city of Izmir. And what little remains of the church, and not much, the original church of Smyrna is has been engulfed by, you know, by the city of Izmir. It's like in one of the one of the neighborhoods. You visit and there are some of the columns and stones and things from the original Christian church in that place. Uh, Izmir is a beautiful town. I think of all the places that we visited in, in Turkey in terms of a modern place to visit, Izmir is one of the most beautiful. I love Istanbul too. I, Istanbul is my second favorite city in the world, I think, uh, after Barcelona. Seattle ranks up there. <laughs> okay, let's look, and let's, any questions about any of that, the map or, yes, you Well, do. you were talking about the, the uh, numbers, and in, and in 21, it gives all the, the size of the new church, uh, or the yes. new earth. Yeah, exactly. But, like, it's the holy city, yeah. I mean, they're very specific about the, you know, 1,400 miles square. Yeah. That isn't very big. Well, it doesn't, doesn't seem like it, does it? Which, again, 1,470 times 7 kind of thing. Yeah. Um, if I get to heaven and I find out that's the exact size, I'm not going to be shocked. Yeah. But I'm also not going to be surprised if I get to heaven and I find out that this was just a way, well, it's like when, when they describe heaven. And we talk about pearly gates and streets of gold, and, and he uses a lot of different stones to describe things. By the way, did you know that some of those stones, we have no idea what they are? We have the word, but we don't know what gemstone or what whatever it refers to. The sense that you get is that when John experienced this vision of the new heaven, he was trying to figure out how to translate this uh, odd, inexplicable thing into words that people might have some sense of what it was. And so he used all these valuable stones and gold and diamond and, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's no way, I don't think we have to believe it's really made out of that. The state, the gates aren't really pearly gates, but they're awesome in such a way that you go, man, this is, this couldn't be more beautiful if it was, if it was made completely out of pearl, you know, or whatever. In the I think the same way, 
Um, I don't take those numbers literally. As I say, if I get to heaven, I find out it actually is 1,400 square miles or something. I'm not going to be disappointed or shocked. God knows what he's doing. It's his plan. He laid out the city. But the indication is probably that those things are symbolic numbers to represent something large. If you'd grown up in the first century, you know, where the average sized town was a few thousand people, 1,400 square miles would seem like a whole lot of place. Okay? And so it may, it may be something as simple as that, the scale. Now, John had lived a lot of years in Ephesus, and Ephesus was a large city. But even that, 1,400 square miles, would be way bigger than the city of Ephesus. So I think it's probably symbolic, but nobody knows for sure. Fair? But it, I've always been fascinated by the fact that there's still a lot of stuff in the Bible we don't actually know what it is, like those gemstones. You can look in the footnotes and they'll say, we have no idea what this is. They, don't, they won't say it that way. They'll say it somewhere that sounds a little more academic. But basically, it means we have no idea what this is. Okay? All right. Let's talk about the outline of the book of Revelation. As I said, it starts with an introduction and prologue where John identifies himself, his addressees, who he's writing to, and the divine source of his vision. And let, me, here, let me read that to you. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants, which will soon take place, that's, why, that's another reason why I think it's future. I don't think it's happened yet. Um, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. And then he says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Okay, so that the whole, what I just read you is the whole prologue, the introduction. And then he gets to the messages to the seven churches of Asia. First he describes the Son of Man as John sees him in the vision. To, in, in, as part of communicating these messages. Then he gives messages to the seven churches. To the church in Ephesus, he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who, who are evil. The church in Ephesus was doing well. And it was not giving in to the heresies of the, the uh, Nicolaitans and others. Smyrna, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich, meaning that even though you're poor in the world's sight, you are rich spiritually. And Smyrna is one of the ones he goes on to caution that there is persecution coming. Pergamum, I know your works and where you live, where Satan's throne is. Now, if you go to the city of Pergamum, the city, the, an ancient city, pre-Roman city, um, in fact, there's an interesting history, Pergamum was ruled by a king, who did not have an heir. Well, when Rome was taken over the whole Mediterranean basin, the king of Pergamum made the Roman Empire his heir. So the Romans wouldn't destroy the city. Now, because the city was very defensible, it's on top of it. A steep, you know, like cliffs on top of this hill. And rather than have the Romans besiege the place and destroy it, which the king was smart enough to know they probably would be able to do eventually, he gave them the city, but he did it so that he would He'd still be king as long as he was alive, but when he died, the Roman Empire was his heir. So Rome had no motivation to destroy the city. But in the lower city of Pergamum, there was a, um, a pagan temple, which had, the story is, it had a throne in it, which was supposed to be a throne for one of the major Greek gods. And that became known to the Christians as the throne of Satan. For one thing, because a lot of the persecutions came out of there. Pergamum, fascinating city, uh, if you ever have a chance to visit. Then, wait a minute, I'm not, did this jump ahead? Oh yeah, I had it all there, sorry. Uh, then Thyatira, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. Sardis, I know your works, that you have a name, that, that you are alive, but you are dead. So some of this is very judgmental. Some is encouragement and positive, some is negative. Philadelphia, I know your works, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. Philadelphia was going to also suffer persecution, it goes on. And this one's fun. Laodicea, I know your works that you are neither hot nor cold because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. He then goes on and says you, you depend upon, your, uh, upon wealth and fancy clothes and, um, and balm for the eyes. Well, again, this is why learning something about these places is interesting. Laodicea is 
not too far, maybe a kilometer or so from Herapolis, another city. And Herapolis had natural hot springs. Well, in order to have hot water, the people in Laodicea created a um, pipe made out of clay. In most places it was open, it was just flowing water. Well, by the time the hot water from Herapolis got to Laodicea, it was only lukewarm. It wasn't really hot anymore. And so this idea of because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, that will spew out of my mouth, takes on a whole interesting kind of thing because John, who had been there many times, would have known about this. And when it talks about, you know, you depend on your money and your expensive clothes and the bowl for your eyes, three things that, that, that uh, Laodicea was known for is being very wealthy, producing very expensive textiles, and producing from some of the local hot springs, muds and stuff, balm that's supposed to be very helpful for the eyes. So there's a lot of stuff in here that has to do with the specifics. And again, that to me, that adds to the credibility, the credence of this stuff. It's, it was written by somebody who knew the place and is specific to the places. All right? Questions about that? So after the introduction, this is the first of the seven sections, which deals with the seven churches. Then we have an, an interesting section. This is all part of the seven seals, but I want to deal with this separately. Um, chapters 4 and 5 are two songs, and some scholars, uh, my old pastor Earl Palmer wrote the commentary on the book of Revelation for the Preacher's Commentary series, and um, you may have even heard me say before, and I got it from Earl, that the two great pillars that the, that the church is built on is the fact that God is our creator and he's our redeemer. Creation and redemption are the two themes on which everything else hangs. Well, chapter 4 of Revelation is a song to God the Creator. Chapter 5 is a song to God the Redeemer. Creation, redemption. And in it, we see the throne of God, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, the Lamb who is found worthy to break the seals of the judgment scroll of God. But those two really are presented as songs, and they are in many ways kind of the, the pillars for the, whole, the center points for the whole rest of the book of Revelation. Now in terms of the seven sections, that is part of the section that deals with the seven seals, because then, when the Lamb is found worthy to break the seals, He then does so. The Lamb of God breaks the seals. The first seal, it appears, from the first seal appears one who is both a king and a conqueror who rides forth on a white horse. Some people have thought this is Jesus. Others have thought, you know, it represents a military conqueror, Alexander the Great, you know, or somebody else. The second seal is a rider on a red horse who brings war to the world. The, and you've heard of the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? These are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, the third seal is a rider on a black horse who brings famine. The fourth seal is a rider on a pale horse who brings uh, death. There actually was a, a oh, his cowboy movie star, Clint Eastwood movie, called The Pale Horseman, in which he, they sort of presented him as bringing death, and I think he doesn't, hardly speaks through the whole movie. It was one of the Italian spaghetti westerns. <laughs> um, so the symbolism carries over a lot. You know, there were four famous football players, alignment, who were called the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Um, then the fifth seal is broken, and from it are, come the souls of the martyrs who are under the altar crying out for vengeance. The sixth seal contains uh, earthquakes and natural disasters, and in that is where we get the 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel who are sealed or saved. And again, I believe that's a symbolic number. Twelve tribes times 12,000, meaning a lot. Oh, sorry. And then the multitude worships God after uh, coming out of the Great Tribulation. We then have the seventh seal. The breaking of the seventh seal begins another series, which are the seven trumpets. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about what all this stuff means. I'm giving you a very superficial. Some of you have been in classes of Revelation with this. Oh, this absolutely means this was this pope or this ruler or this emperor or this, you know, this the head of the Southern Baptist Convention, or whoever it was. <laughs> I don't think we go there, all right? Because we get obsessed with those kind of things, and the devil starts driving us off in a direction that's not helpful to us. 
we need to look at the larger issues, and in this case, it has to do with the fact that the Lamb of God is the one who has power over all things that are happening, and that He alone is worthy. Okay, we deal with that. So then, the breaking of the seventh seal leads us to the next section, that is the third section of seven, and it is the section of the seven trumpets. The angels sound the trumpets. The first in the first trumpet, the hail and fire destroy a third of the trees and the grass on the earth. The second trumpet, a third of the oceans are destroyed. The third trumpet, a third of the rivers and springs are poisoned. With the fourth trumpet, a third of the sky is darkened. With the fifth trumpet, a plague of locusts terrorize the earth for five months. With the sixth seal, an army of 200 million kill one-third of the Earth's people. And in this section, we also have John eating a little book which is sweet to his mouth but bitter in his stomach, which is exactly the way that the scroll is described by Ezekiel. Okay. And we have two witnesses who come to witness and prophesy for God. They witness for three and a half years, but they are killed. Their bodies lie in the streets for, uh, for several days, and it says everyone in the world sees them. And then they come back to life, which must have been really exciting for the people who killed them, um, because they were seen as, as witnesses to God. Now, that's something that I find fascinating is that 20 years ago, the I, or 30 years ago, whatever, the idea that two bodies could lie in the street for several days and everyone on the planet could see them, how's that going to work? Well, we can easily understand how that could work now. You know, all it takes is somebody with a camera that shoots video and a, you know, uplink to the internet, which gets picked up by the broadcast stations for those places that don't have internet access. It can happen. Then we have the seventh trumpet, which is, um, it's during the seventh trumpet, the Ark of the Covenant is seen as appearing in the heavenly temple. And within the seventh trumpet, a number of other things happen. God's, or, I'm sorry, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the seventh vision. These are all connected. At the end of the seventh trumpet, there then are seven visions, which is the fourth section of seven. John sees a woman clothed with the sun, moon, and stars. Satan is cast down out of heaven to earth. The dragon persecutes the people of God. The beast from the sea makes war with the people of God. The beast from the land forces people to worship the beast from the sea, and there are other names that get used for these as well. Then John sees the 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads with the Lamb on Mount Zion. The three angels proclaim judgment, and then the angels reap the harvest. These are the seven visions that John has as the fourth section. Then we get to the fifth section of seven. Um, this is where the angels pour out their bowls on the earth, and each of these bowls contains a plague, as if it hasn't been bad enough already. First, seven angels are given seven bowls containing God's wrath. The first bowl contains foul and loathsome sores that afflict the followers of the beast. The second bowl turns the sea to blood and everything in it dies. The third bowl um, turns all fresh water to blood. The fourth bowl, the sun scorches the earth with intense heat. The fifth bowl, there is total darkness and great pain. The sixth bowl, there is preparation for the final battle of good versus evil. And the seventh bowl releases a great earthquake so that every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And I know that some people have said, oh, well, you know what? If, if the solar system, if the sun starts to turn black, or the sun starts to, you know, to go out, and it's not going to happen instantaneously, well then, Various of these things are going to happen as a result of that. I don't know. Maybe that's how God's going to do it. And the extent to which this is just a symbol, or the extent to which some of this is literal, we don't know. We then have the next section, the sixth section, has to do with Babylon the Great and the fall of Babylon. There are seven words on the fall of Babylon. We have a picture of the great harlot who sits on many waters, Babylon the Great, and I'm not, I'm not, well, I won't do that. I had an idea about that once, but I'm not going to go there. Then Babylon is destroyed. The people of the earth mourn Babylon's destruction. And one of the things is that if Babylon represented Rome, well, the Roman Empire's gone. So how do we deal with that? 
Is there some other country that takes over as Babylon who sits on all the waters of the earth? Um, okay. <laughs> then we have the permanence of Babylon's destruction. Then we are given a picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb where a great multitude praises God and the marriage supper itself. We then come to the seventh group which is the telling of the story of the millennium, the thousand year reign. First, the beast and the false prophet, which are the, the beast from the sea and the beast from the land, um, are cast into the lake of fire. Satan is imprisoned in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. And by the way, we're told God doesn't, God or Jesus doesn't go down and defeat Satan. The archangel Michael does, because Satan, when he was Lucifer, was an archangel. And Michael, the archangel who's head of, the, of God's armies, is sufficiently strong to defeat him. God does not have to, you know, God and the devil are not equal. It's God and the devil. And down here are my, our, the archangels Michael and Gabriel and whatever, okay? So Satan is imprisoned in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. The resurrected martyrs and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And then after the thousand year millennium, this is still the, the part of the seven final visions, Satan is released and attempts to make war against the people of God, but is defeated. Satan is cast into the lake of fire. The last judgment occurs where the wicked, along with death and Hades, are cast into the lake of fire. And we then have a vision of the new heaven and the new earth. The new heaven and new earth where there is no more suffering or death. And I'm going to read you that passage in a minute. Um, we're told that God dwells with humanity in the new Jerusalem. There is a description of the new Jerusalem, what it looks like including measurements. The river and tree of life appear for the healing of the nations, and the curse is brought to an end. And then, after those seven groups of sevens, we have the conclusion, Christ's assurance that his coming is imminent, and final admonitions. Okay? This is the outline of the book of Revelation. And again, we can pick any one of those symbols and go crazy with trying to figure out what it means. I have other things to do. You know, just knock yourself out. I don't think that's healthy, but people do it. Okay, I now want to read you this passage, which to me is the culmination of the whole book. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. I often will use this in memorial services because I do think it, it gives us, this is where it's all going. This is our hope. This is our expectation. Uh, from the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, so the next to the last, um, and it starts with verse 1. Then I, John speaking still, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. That's us, by the way. We are the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the body of Christ. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who, has, who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God. They will be my children. He then does go on to talk about those who are immoral, those who have not followed him or accepted him. Okay. But this is the culmination of the whole, whole book. And this is what I think the point is, not, you know, well, that fourth lampstand, does that represent the lamp stands all represent churches. But you get the idea. Any questions about that? I want to do a little bit more about millennialism, much as I hate to. <laughs> um, because people, again, so much eschatological doctrine is developed out of the book of, of, of Revelation. Does this come first? Does that come first? Is this going on at the same time that that's going on? Etc. There are three major views. I'll propose it for it. But there are three major views of interpretation of the end times in Revelation in terms of the sequence of things. 
The first is called premillennialism. This is a belief that Jesus will return and will be physically on the earth for a thousand year millennial reign in literal interpretation of Revelation 21 to 6. Now, this may be pre tribulation premillennialism or post tribulation premillennialism. Um, what that means is there's a thousand years of tribulation, of suffering. Pre trib uh, premillennialists say that before the millennium, there will be. Um, that all Christians will be taken up to heaven so that we will not have to suffer the trials of the tribulation. Post-tribulation says we will live through that. And that um, that tribulation period is something we will have to you know, go through. I tend to be post-trib because everybody I've ever met that was pre-tribulation, I think it's wishful thinking. They just don't want to have to suffer. They don't want to have to go through the difficulties of the tribulation. And yet I, in studying this, I have not found any indication to suggest that there's any reason we won't. In fact, this book is full of people of the faith. The martyrs, those, you know, the people who have suffered for the Lord are represented in here. So I tend to think that that, um, that Christians will go through the tribulation. I'm actually going to give you a couple of charts in it so you can see this. So premillennialism, and that is that Jesus will come back before the thousand year reign. Then there is amillennialism, the belief that the thousand years referred to in Revelation is a symbolic number, and that the millennium has already begun in the current church age. That the age we're in now, that is the age between the death of Jesus and the return of Jesus, is what is being referred to symbolically by the millennium. And a thousand years is just a lot in that point, right? The third view is postmillennialism. The belief that Jesus will return after the thousand year golden age. Now, the, the, millenn the, the millennium is seen as a golden time, as a positive time. The tribulation, not. And so those two are both referred to. Post millennialism believes that the thousand year golden age of the, of the millennium will be prior to Jesus' return, but it will be the age of the church in which Christian, Christians and Christian ethics will prosper. This is the period of time when some people say that the Jews, as, as indicated in uh, Romans that the Jews will return in mass to, to God and believing in Jesus. Now, there's, there, again, there's different interpretations, even in post-millennialism, whether that thousand years is literal or figurative. But I'll say it before somebody else here does. I believe in pan-millennialism, which means it'll all pan out in the end. We don't know. I think all of this is conjecture. And people who, you know, plant their flag and say, if you are not a premillennial post-tribulation person, then you don't really believe God's word is true. Well, have you heard about humility? Okay, we don't know. The reason that there's such varying doctrines here, or ideas about it, is because it's not clear. And it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect our faith or how we practice our faith. Okay? If it did, then it would be a different issue. But what, how this all is sort of overlapped or overlaid or how it's going to roll out in the end does not affect our responsibilities as believers today. Okay? Can I get an amen? Okay. <laughs> now, these charts give you kind of an idea, although they may just confuse you more. Uh, the first one is a post-tribulation premillennialist view. Okay? The idea is this would have been the death of Christ. <clears throat> that at some point, and we're somewhere in here, so we don't know exactly where, there will be a period of tribulation in which the church will suffer. And then Jesus will return, and there will be a thousand year reign, and at the end of that thousand year reign, there will be a last judgment. That is post tribulation premillennialism, which means the millennium is after the tribulation, but Jesus returns before the millennium. Got it? Post trib premillennium. The second view is pre-trib, premillennialism, which is tends to be the dispensationalist view. Dispensationalism is a theological construct which basically takes all of the events of history and breaks it up in dispensations. And basically says God had a particular plan for this particular period of time. That's not Reformed theology, and I don't agree with it because it seems to me that, that the, the, 
you can't get away from the suggestion as, pre, as dispensationalism in the way that I understand it, and I've studied quite a bit, says God, is, God works along for a period of time and then he goes, well, that's not working. I'm going to have to do something else. And so he comes up with a different dispensation with a completely different strategy. Like, the, like God's plan during the Old Testament time under the law, that, that he put the law in place to try to work and it didn't, and so he had to stop using the law and come up with something else. Okay, I don't think that's true. That's not how God works, that's not who God is. But pre-trib dispens pre, uh, dispensationalist premillennialism says that from the time of Jesus, there's a period of time, and that the, the, the church, uh, that Jesus will return and rapture the church before the tribulation. That's why it's called pre-tribulation. So we're going to get sucked up before the tribulation. Then Jesus will return with the church, bringing the church back with him. And that Jesus and the church will reign during the millennium period, the thousand years. And then there will be the last judgment. That's pre-trib, pre-millennialism. Okay? Some of you are smiling. You feel about this the same way I do. <laughs> and yet you need to know this because you'll bump into people that say, so are you pre-trib or post-trib? You pre-millennial or post-millennial? You know. uh, post-millennialism is a little bit simpler. That is that we are going along here, we will reach a thousand years of blessing, and then the second coming last judgment. It pretty much does away with the idea of the tribulation as per se, because it believes that the period of time we're in now, all of it, is sort of the tribulation, the suffering of the church. And while it may not feel like it to us, trust me, most of the Christians around the world feel that. And then there is amillennialism, meaning this is all symbolic. Um, you know, there's no particular timeline. It's not just a thousand years, and then there will be the second coming in the last judgment all at once. Okay? Questions about that? What's the most common uh, predominant uh, today? Probably, I would guess amillennialism. I don't know that. And the reason I say that is because there are more liberal Christians and conservative Christians, and so they would mostly just sort of, ah, you know, I think it's all simple. Yeah, that was sort of my feeling, but I don't yeah. know if it was just me on the um, tangent. I think that for evangelicals, Greek, um, really? Not for evangelicals, for fundamentalists. Oh, maybe. fundamentalists, yeah. That's There's a difference. I'm sorry, yeah. Fundamentalists, who are the ones who don't want to have to go through the tribulation, again, I think it's wishful thinking, let's say pre tribulation, um, uh, pre millennialism. For most um, evangelicals, I think. Um, meaning conservative theology, but, excuse me for this, but a little more thoughtful in terms of scholarship and things, um, they would tend to probably to be that the tribulation is going to happen or even is happening, and that at a certain point the Lord will return and there will be a millennium reign before the last judgment. But the reason they're all up there is all of them have a significant number of advocates. Any comment or question about that or other experiences you've had with it? But the second coming, there's only going to be one. Well, yes, except if you are a pre-trib, pre-millennialist, you believe that there is the rapture of the church, that yeah. Jesus will appear in the clouds, call the church up with him, to be in heaven with him during the tribulation, and then he will come back with the church for the introduction of, this, of, the, uh, of the millennium, the millennium reign, which is, again, tribulation negative, millennial reign positive. So, I, I think, I don't agree with that, but they're proposing that Jesus actually will come back twice. Okay, questions? Okay, now forget all this. I wanted you to see it because you need to know that some people, for some people, this is the most important part of their Christian doctrine. How it's all going to end. Well, yes, we should be people of hope. We have expectations. We should glory in that passage from from the 21st chapter of Revelation. We need to be excited about the fact that as, as those who are part of the body of Christ, whether there be tribulation or not, that we will be in His presence forever and ever with no more mourning or crying or suffering or death. That's wonderful. But the details of how we get between here and there are not clear and they're not that important. I don't think. Uh, somebody else felt this great. Any questions? Can I pick and choose? <laughs> sure. Like everybody else, pick and choose. Uh, I mean, there are other there are other ideas that are you know 
completely wacky. It doesn't even fit into any of these categories, like David Koresh's ideas or whatever. Okay, Bob, and then Ken. Just wonder if there were mushrooms on the Nile of Patmos. <laughs> well, we're told it was a vision from God, and we believe it's true. So whether or not he used any chemical substances to create that vision, that's up to him. Ken? Well, most said it's interesting for me because I grew up, I guess, with an amillennialist, and then kind of a, taking it, the book of Revelation, as more figurative, and then I would have been in a group that took it literal, and I was, I was always uh, uh, had the question, okay, you don't take every bit of this literal, and where do you decide, and how do you decide which is literal and which isn't? Because you, you know that, and that was always my question to them, and there right. was never a really good answer to that, other than this. I like. I, I want to take this part literal, and I want to take this, make this part figurative. Um, I think the parts that we have to take literally are the parts that tell us that Jesus wins. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, the details of how we get there, I don't think we have to take literally. I mean, when we read this section about, you know, I will be your God and you will be my children and I will live in your presence, I take that very literally. Mm -hmm. The part about the Lamb of God is the only one who is worthy to open the seals. I don't know what the seals are, but I take very literally the fact that, that the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is the only one worthy to do anything having to do with creation. Mm -hmm. you know, not me or not the people who interpret this, this stuff. And so, all of the details in between those kinds of passages, I'm willing to say I don't really know. But I know that the Lamb of God is worthy. I know that the last judgment will happen. I know that God will be present with us and we with Him for all eternity. Those things I take very literally. And so, for me, the in-between stuff, they're like, to me, they're like the footnotes in a book. You can read the book and do just fine without reading all the footnotes. Okay? Doesn't mean the footnotes aren't useful, and sometimes there's there's valuable insights in the footnotes, but any book that you have to read the footnotes in order to get the flow of the book is not a good book. And this is the good book. So I don't I think that all of the details of that stuff, while it, you know, there may be there certainly is interest, there may even be value, it is not ultimate value. Too often, people get so focused on those footnotes, which are the symbolic things, that they forget what the main story is. And I want to stick with the main story. Is that fair? Oh, yeah. And I think what's beautiful about the book of Revelation, and the way it ends, is he talks about Jesus, the bridegroom, coming for his bride, which is a, a theme throughout the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. Even in the Old Testament, Israel is is regarded as the bride of God. And so you see a completion of the, of the whole beautiful picture that God is trying to paint with mankind that you are, uh, you know, my, I, I'm your bridegroom and you're my bride and I love you and this, you know, this is what I want for our relationship. Anything else? So it's not that scary, is it? Okay, you guys get 45 minutes off today. <laughs>